My name is Dave Drobecki, and boy, short version of my story. Um, I think that's the first time someone's asked me to actually do that, and it's so hard. You can just do your best. Yeah, I, I grew up as a, as a young boy with a dream to become a Major League Baseball player. And um, I saw that dream become a reality in 1982 um, when I was called up to the big leagues by the San Diego Padres. And all of a sudden, I began this incredible journey that um, took me um, on some incredible experiences that would ultimately shape who I am today. Um, and I base that really on the good, the bad, and the ugly of my story. Um, but um, playing for the Padres, I was able to experience being in an all-star game, a World Series, and then being traded to the San Francisco Giants where um, playing for them, I was pitching the best I had pitched in my entire career. And then all of a sudden, a year later, after that trade to the San Francisco Giants, a lump had developed in my left arm, and as a left-handed pitcher, that wasn't good. Yeah. Um, it ultimately was diagnosed with cancer, and it just, um, it just took us into this new place where it was very scary. Um, the uncertainty, being faced with your, with your mortality at the age of 32 um, was um, just nothing that you would have expected to run into right. in this story that was so good. And, right. and this is that. The doctors told us that outside of a miracle, I would never pitch again. And then 10 months later, I was standing on the mountain pitching. And making 10 months? Cut. Yeah, 10 months later, after I had done incredible surgery, you know, removed 10 and a half hours, removed the deltoid muscle, um, and did a bunch of um, stuff on top of that to try and kill the cancer in the arm. And 10 months later, I was standing on the mound pitching again against the Cincinnati Reds, and we won that game 4-3. to three, And I was actually the winner in that game. Five days later, I'm pitching in Montreal in the sixth inning, and I throw a pitch in my left arm snaps in half. And my career comes to an end. The cancer reoccurs, and now as I sit here before you um, in this interview, um, my left arm and shoulder are gone as a result of the cancer continuing to grow. And the doctor's saying, we're going to need to take your arm and shoulder to save your life. Wow. That's it's such a roller coaster, man. It's like up at the very top and then down to the depths and up. And I mean, how did you deal with that? Well, you know... Um, Obviously, our faith played a huge part in that. You know, um, it was while I was with the Padres in their minor league system that my wife and I ran into Jesus. And as a result of um, that summer, um, making a commitment to follow him, um, which really stemmed from my upbringing and being aware of who God was in my life and having this incredible respect for him, yet not fully understanding um, you know, all that was behind what he had done for me. Yeah. And and so that summer, um, I was challenged to actually read the scriptures to discover who I was in relationship to God. And it was the coolest experience. Running into his love in the midst of, you know, my stuff, my sin was just absolutely amazing. And to know that in spite of all that, he loved me more than I could comprehend was the most beautiful message that I could hear. It's the most beautiful message that anyone can hear. And, and so, you know, that faith was part of what sustained us on the journey. But I will tell you, I struggled tremendously, yeah. um, not only physically, which you would understand, but emotionally and spiritually. And it wasn't so much questioning God. It was trying to understand um, the implications of pain and suffering in view of a God who loves me. Yeah. And so there were all kinds of things being thrown at me, you know. Um, I know why you're suffering, Dave, because you've got sin in your life. Mm. Well, duh. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to argue that. But, um, you know, you, you wrestle with that, you know, from a spiritual perspective. Okay, God, is there something I've done to deserve this? And, yeah. and then, then it was, you know, you just don't have enough faith. <laughs> and, I, and I thought to myself, how much faith does one need? Yeah. You know, and so there were all these things that happened in the midst of this incredible roller coaster that you've spoken of, where there were extreme highs and extreme lows. 
um, where the focus was, was really in the valley. Yeah. Um, it was really wrestling with all these questions. And I think it was a wonderful time in our life to wrestle with those things because what we discovered in the midst of all of this is that God really, there's so much to God that's mystery. And yeah. so much to life we don't understand. And yet at the same time, the beauty of God's love for me was not in necessarily knowing all the answers, David. It was in knowing um, how much he cared for me as I walked this journey. And the only way that I could connect with that was through people. Wow. It was the beauty of God placing just the right person or group of people in our lives at the right time that kept nudging us forward, leaning into him more, and trusting him on the journey, even in the midst of the uncertainty. Wow. So that was just a really, really cool part of, you know, what we were experiencing during that time. However, I will tell you that, I mean, it ebbed and flowed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were moments of, um, of depression, significant depression. I mean, yep. my wife and I both went into clinical depression as we were living out this story and more of it after baseball than while I was playing and made the comeback. Yeah. And, you know, we ended up in counseling for 18 months, um, trying to understand what was going on in each of our lives and how that impacted us as a couple. Yeah. We were both on medication, and during that period of time, oh my gosh, in the Christian community, that was taboo. Right. Oh, you don't take medicine, you just trust God. And, right. and, and we thought, oh my gosh, if... If God is the one that's gifted all these people in this universe that he uses for his purposes, then why couldn't he use someone who created something like Prozac to help me with my depression? Yeah. You know? And, and, and why couldn't he use a counselor who could walk me through the story that I was living and help me understand it better in the context of where God was wow. in that story and what I needed to know about myself in this story? Wow. And so, you know, that was just a that was just an amazing period of time and and then it there was a there was a season of real ugliness in that I became verbally abusive to my wife and kids. You know, I didn't know how as much as I wanted desperately to articulate my pain, I didn't know how to do it. Yeah. And so, you know, as much as I thought I was a good communicator because I was <laughs> The ironic irony of all of this is I was going out and telling my story and then coming back to this this frustrated, angry man behind closed doors. Yeah. And and so connecting with the reality of my pain and what was going on in here and how to share that, how to become vulnerable. Because in vulnerability, what I learned was that's where I could find peace and freedom. Wow. I didn't have to hide. I didn't have to hide behind something, a mask, that said this this life as a Christian in this world that you've been placed in is all about your image, Dave. Mm -hmm. And that was so wrong. It was simply about understanding that it's okay to be me in the midst of something that's extremely difficult. Yeah. And oh, by the way, on my worst day, God was still going to love me more than I could comprehend. Yeah. Because that's the power of his grace. Wow. And, and so the counseling drew a lot of this out to be able to become more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. The counseling actually took me to the next level when I was released. My wife and I were, were released after 18 months of counseling. Now in 1992, um, after, um, just to give you a little chronological way, um, to understand this chronologically, sure. 1988, 1988 I was diagnosed. Okay. 1989, I made the comeback. The end of 1989, I retired. The cancer came back in 1990 and in 1991. And then in June of 1991, I had the amputation to remove my left arm and shoulder. Wow. Um, roughly three weeks after that, we entered into counseling for 18 months. Wow. And during that period of time, I began to learn and understand the dynamics of being vulnerable. And yeah. once we were released from the counseling, that 18 months, um, Jan had received a book, a manuscript to read and endorse by Gary Oliver, who specialized in anger management. And in reading the book, she said, gosh, he lives only 30 minutes from us. Would you be open to going to him to help you with your anger issues? 
And I said, absolutely, because I don't want to be this guy anymore. Right. It's not the desire of my heart to get to this place where I can't manage my emotions well. And so I went into counseling, and my wife supported me every step of the way. Every step, she was there. She came to every counseling session with Gary, and he helped me to develop the tools over a 12-month period in how to deal with my anger. And the beauty in all of that is that um, when Gary released us, from that point forward, which was roughly 1993, that we were released from his counseling, my wife said over the next 22 years, roughly, actually now it's, 1994, we're looking at 25 years, right? Mm -hmm. That she's seen me um, erupt like Mount Vesuvius. So, so the spirit of the living God really is alive and well in Dave Direction. Yeah. And he's taking over that anger room. Yeah. And, and as a result of that, um, our marriage and our life has been absolutely amazing. Not perfect. Oh. but amazing as we've journeyed with God um, through the peaks and the valleys and some of those difficult places in growing up and maturing to become more like the person that he created me to be when he invaded my heart on August 27th of 1981. Yeah. Because the beauty of what I've come to learn, David, that's so powerful is that I never realized 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says you've been made brand new. When Jesus comes in, you're made brand new. Wow. And my whole life, up until about eight years ago, was lived trying to fix the old man because that's who I thought Jesus died for. Right, wow. And he, and he died on the cross to put the old man in the grave. And he gave me a new life coming up out of the grave that I now had the opportunity to live in him because it really is Christ in me. Right. That, so, um, sorry to cut you off there, but um, no, okay. I'm just so curious. When you've lost, um, when you've lost the baseball, and you're dealing with like, what is my new purpose? Like baseball, was that your like? Were you struggling with? I've lost my purpose of baseball. So now, what do I do? And then, how did you find that? Yeah, actually, actually, that's a part of the depression. Yeah, um, that I went into because I had an identity crisis. My wife and I refer it to our identity crisis because when I came out of the game, I had no idea what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, being a professional athlete, um, you know, you're wrapped up your whole life in this one game. And that's all I was wrapped up in during that whole period of time from the time I was eight until the time I retired from baseball. I was a baseball player. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, who is Dave if he can no longer be a baseball player? And, and that was a very difficult time, extremely difficult, because I wasn't playing in an era where we made multi-million dollar contracts. As a matter of fact, when I retired in 1989, it was one year later that the multi-million dollar contracts began. Huh. And so it's not that I didn't get paid well, but when I retired, I had to go to work. Right. I had to get a job. Well, now that you're retired, you've, you've struggled with all these physical um, issues up until an amputation in 1991, uh, who's going to hire you as an amputee? What are you going to do with your life? I'm sure you've had those same questions, yep. your identity crisis. You can relate to this story. Yeah. And the reality was, that's what took me deep, deep into the dark pit of depression and, and ultimately the ugliness of the anger. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't in my wrestling with God, it was wrestling with myself. Yeah. And this, this identity that was so wrapped up in being a baseball player and not fully understanding in those moments of that difficult process who I was in Christ. That was always there. It wasn't going to go anywhere. But I got to tell you, it was really foggy during that time. Because it was obvious I was identifying as a ball player and not as as one who is a Christ follower. Um, and, and, I, and I don't mean to even separate out the two because you can't. Right. I mean, I was a baseball player and I am a Christ follower. 
Mm-hmm. But my focus was so much more on identifying with that baseball player and not realizing that in the midst of this struggle, I could, hmm, I can't even say that. Because even in the midst of the struggle, I leaned on him tremendously. But but my faith journey was still hard. Sure. But still hard. Sure. And, and I guess maybe part of the reason why was because I was so wrapped up in performance as an athlete that my, my view of Christianity was all wrapped up in performance too as well. Right. You're always you know, trying to improve. Even if you don't see yourself as a bad baseball player, you're still trying to improve. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I, I translate that right over into my faith. And, I, and, and the sad part about that was that I, I, I always thought in God's eyes I needed to be the perfect Christian and there was no way I was going to get there. And somehow grace would be filtered in there, but I never understood grace for what it really is and that it has nothing to do with my performance. It has everything to do with simply trusting him as I live this life. Yeah. And as I trust him, I draw closer to his heart. The more I trust, the more I see him move. The more I see him move, the more I trust. And as I trust, I get closer to his heart. Wow. So yes. would you say that, I mean, you found your purpose in God and then and then through through that, you found speaking and, and, and other outlets, like how has that kind of gone? Like what do you kind of, what do you find tangibly on, on earth, obviously, because like our purpose is to be Christ-like and, you know. Yeah. But like how has that translated into your new life? Yeah, that's really good because my purpose is really in life is, is understanding and knowing who I am. Hmm. That's my purpose. Wow. My purpose with every day is to walk closer with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Because out of that, if I understand and, and find what those gifts are that he's given me, then that just simply gets to be lived out in the arena that I move into. And what I've discovered is, what I've discovered is my whole life is about his purpose. And that purpose is to glorify him. So what has he given me? What has he given me that I can use? Yes. He's given you a voice. He's given you the ability to, um, to write music and to produce music. And you've, you've established and discovered this beautiful gift. And the beauty of all of that in him is that you simply get to be Christ in me through those gifts. Yes. No matter where you go, no matter who you come face to face with. And so for Dave Trevecki, what I discovered a while back by taking a little test was that I'm verbal. And I'm sure you can understand that now. Listen to me, (laughs) okay? But in my verbalness, I've also discovered that I love people and I love sharing my story. And, And it's simply about being Jesus instead of doing Jesus. And, and, and so no matter where I go, no matter whether it's with the Giants as an ambassador at the ballpark and getting the opportunity to love people and share my story with them, or traveling the country, telling this story and spending time with a group of 150 people to 3,000 people and just being able to love on them as I share my story, or through our ministry endurance where we can come alongside families who are battling in the same way we have and encourage them to help them understand where God is when it hurts. Um, that's, that's my life. Yeah. If, if you want to know what it means to be a Christian, you just live your life knowing who you are in Christ wow. and taking the gifts and talents into the marketplace and reflecting him through those gifts and talents. Yeah. That's it, man. Yeah, my absolutely. world is shaking. Like, oh, <laughs> <blow it up. laughs> yeah. you know here's the here's the irony in all of this. Had you talked to me prior to getting hurt, I would have been telling you about how important it is to be in your Bible and how important it is to be praying every day and how important it is to establish spiritual disciplines and how important it is to do this and how important it is to do that and be a part of this group and be a part of that group and go take a trip to Africa and do all those things. And, no, no, that's not it. It's simply trusting God and being who he has made me to be in him. And, and, and then, 
you know what I've discovered when I embraced that eight years ago through reading a book called The Cure, hmm. written by a dear friend of mine, John Lynch. When I read that book, it set me free, free from the bondage of performance as a Christian. Wow. And in the freedom from that bondage, David, I have never spent more time praying in the scriptures, searching out small yeah. groups, being in church and worshiping the God of the universe, spending time with people so that I get the opportunity to love on them and doing those things that, that are who I am now. Yeah. And it's been absolutely mind-boggling to me that I have put very, the only effort that I've really put into this is to simply respond to the God of this universe whose response to me was, I love you so much. I am going to give my son in death so that you can have life. Wow. What? <laughs> what? I mean, Getting emotional. Wow. <laughs> and we get, we get, the beauty of that is if we fully understand the power of what that means to us right in here, then we, we get to live that out every day. By res our response is loving him, which we will never do, in the same way that he's loved us. But oh my gosh, what, an, what, a, what a wonderful experience it is to show yeah. that to others. Yeah. Because you know how powerful it is in your own life. Yep. Wow. So, <laughs> this is your, this is, it's in here for you. I can yeah, tell. It's, it's in here. Yeah. It's in here. My, my wife actually says, whatever you do, if you ask Dave to come and speak, just know he will never come with an outline. He will never come with notes because the only way he knows how to give whatever he's been called to give it's got to come from here. Yeah. And when it comes from here yeah. and it comes out here, somehow God makes it sound good. So. <laughs> you just explained myself to me because I don't like <laughs> notes. And and that's why. I never knew that. But that's why. I, I like it to feel like it's coming from me instead of something I'm regurgitating. You know, I got to tell you, when I listened to your music, um, one of the cool things was um, it, that was the expression of your music. You know, by the way, we love animals. Yes. We love them, man. <laughs> Thanks. That's really encouraging to hear. You could yeah. you could tell that you in your music. It's obvious. Yeah, it's obvious. Wow.